Arteta. What a What a Hello and welcome to the Arsenal Vision post-match podcast with your host today, me, Tim Stillman. That's right, Elliot is waylaid with work. He's just not committed enough to the podcast, so he's had a big paddy and he's left me in the host chair. But hopefully this does mean that some of our guests will be able to finish their answers without being interrupted. Um, We'll see presently. Um, Before I introduce um, our guests for today, I just wanted to do a little bit of admin. Um, First of all, just to say uh, for patrons, we recorded an episode earlier this week, uh, a special on the Arsenal career of Theo Walcott and in the spotlight special. So if you haven't seen or downloaded that already, um, please do. A really interesting kind of 70, 80 minute discussion about uh, one of the more interesting and certainly more divisive Arsenal players over the last kind of 10 to 15 years or so. And uh, we're going to do like a little mini series actually on 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 some players, a bit like Theo, who may be divided opinion and sparked debate, et cetera, et cetera. And w- we felt like Theo Walcott was the natural place to start for that. Um, also, uh, this is something that Elliot announced on that patron podcast, but I don't think we've done it yet. Uh, for the main podcast, you some of you will know that we started a fundraiser for the Arsenal Foundation about a week and a half ago. Um, we had the aim of raising £10,000, and we thought that that might take about a month. Um, we did it, well, you did it, in just under a week, actually. So we reached that target. We've now raised over £10,000 for the Arsenal Foundation. So on behalf of Elliot and all of the panel, we just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone um, who donated um, or who gave the cause a push in any way they can, particularly in these times. We know it's tough out there for people. So to be able to raise that sort of sum in seven days was was quite astonishing. And, and we're kind of really taken back by everyone's generosity. Um, that link is still live because just because we've exceeded our target doesn't mean we have to close the link. Uh, and we'll throw that out with the pod description notes. So if people still want to contribute, um, they can do. Um, so today we're going to talk, we're going to do a little bit of a general chat about kind of Project Restart in the Premier League, the Bundesliga coming back, um, Ligue 1, I guess, being uh, being suspended, being shut down uh, for the season and, and, and the debates that all of this is causing, both moral, economic, um, practical, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we're just going to have a little general talk about that. And with me to discuss that. First, we have uh, Clive, who you can follow on Twitter, at ClivePAFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. We also have, to kind of keep the Yankee, uh, to keep the Yankee element to the pod, we've got Scott, who you can follow on Twitter, at O underscore that underscore crab. Hello, Scott. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad to be the, the token Yankee. <laughs> and... Uh, and, and, and the token Irishman um, as well. We've got Paul, who you can follow on Twitter, uh, at Posen in my pants. Paul, hello there. Every top podcast needs an Irishman. So. Uh, agreed, agreed. Um, I won't work on a podcast without one. <laughs> um, <laughs> literally. Um, so, Paul, I'm going to start with you, actually. Um We'll go into and we'll kind of um, pick the bones out of, like I said, like the moral, the political, the economic side of, you know, Project Restart. But, um, for example, uh, which is a Premier League initiative, but some leagues are kind of creeping back into life now. We've got the Bundesliga is starting again next weekend. Uh, The K-League in Korea uh, kicked off again this morning. Um, So putting aside all of the kind of the economic, the political, the moral, et cetera, et cetera, um, is there any chance that you'll be watching any of these Bundesliga games? I don't know how interested you are in the league anyway. I I guess I wanted to get to the bottom of the kind of do you feel um, emotionally ready um, yet to watch football? Um, Well, it's been weird. Um, I thought I'd miss it loads. I think people have had various forms of this discussion, but I kind of, there's a part of me that's kind of enjoyed getting big chunks of my life back. Um, Mm. So that was kind of odd. I always thought it was filling a hole for me. And I think ultimately it will be. Uh, I think because everything's odd the whole time that you're kind of 
built into this, you know, working from home, not going out. You've kind of created this new world uh, and an expectation of what your day is going to be like, a new structure that you know is semi-temporary, semi-permanent, uh, but it'll change in some form in a few weeks' time. Or it, It'll be really odd when they let us go go out and do things and go to stores and stuff it'll be like really am i allowed to mm. um can i touch that can i you mean i can just you know go over there do this i can go to two places i can you know um so i think there's this kind of semi permanent uh world we're living in that i've quite quickly adapted to and it it'll mm. be weird when they suddenly op- open the door and we all float out and can do things. And then I think it'll be interesting again to see how much we miss things. But to the question, will I be watching Bundesliga football? Yes. Um, I've tried to get into Bundesliga a few times. It's something I think I should be really into. And I, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I like the values of the Bundesliga, the way they've, the, the, uh, the cultural aspects. I work for a German company, by the way. We have about uh, 800 employees and probably 400 are German. My my bosses are German. I, qu- I quite like Germans. I've come to to warm to them and the culture, and the, uh, I like working for a German-centric company. Um, and so I really ought to be into this German thing, but I've never, I think I've seen other people say something similar. They've tried to get into supporting a team, be it... Uh, Dortmund or whoever and they just can't quite warm to it and I don't really know why the the fans are great the stadium is great the the ethos of the league is great but I've never quite been able to just give enough of a darn to watch two games in a row let alone like the shite I watch (laughs) with with (laughs) Arsenal the crappy performances the terrible games you know days when we it's truly a library where every player disappoints, where like we're going nowhere, doing nothing, and we're getting worse. The games I've watched on that side, and yet, you know, here's this fine footballing performance in the Bundesliga, and I just, I don't know why. I don't care. So I'm going to have one more go at caring, and it'll be football, and it'll also be interesting to just kind of project onto that what will, what does that mean for the Premier League then, and for Arsenal, and how will that feel? So Yes, I'll be watching. I don't know if I can stick with it. Is the problem? Yeah, yeah. I th- I think, um, and I'll come to you on that. I'll, I'll let you have a crack at that, Clive. But I, I think you you kind of you hit on some important points there about you know how you feel now and how we might because it kind of feels like we're coming into phase two. Mm. So like nowhere near the end of coronavirus, but maybe you know restrictions being relaxed. And one of the things I've been thinking about recently is you, you spoke there about like getting some time back and actually that's something because i'm with you i i haven't missed it as much as i thought and i've actually quite enjoyed getting my time sometimes i feel like i have a bit too much time at the weekends but um what's going to feel really weird for me is the days are going to feel really really hectic and really short when we go back to something approaching normal so i'm not commuting at the moment and i'm not going to football every kind of saturday or sunday and kind of rushing around i've got all this time at the moment and when that starts to go i'm, I'm i reckon i'm gonna feel knackered i reckon like psychologically i'm, I'm gonna feel you know I, I think this will happen to a lot of people it will be like wow the the days feel like they're about six hours long at the moment and so clive i, I kind of want to come to you on that like do you feel um you know emotionally ready i guess Let, let's say it wasn't the bundesliga and it was the premier league coming back next weekend behind closed doors would you feel kind of um, psychologically ready, like for it to come back into your life yet, or do you feel like you're not there yet? It's all based on confidence, really, isn't it? I mean, our economy is based on consumer confidence, and I'm I'm looking at these what's happening in Germany. I'm looking at footballer confidence, really, because football's a contact game, and I'm going to be really wanting to see if, how players behave. Yeah, you know, on on the general. I mean, that sounds crazy, but we, we need we need to be in contact with each other to play the game properly. And so, will the players feel confident enough 
to do that. So that's that's one thing I'm really looking at closely, and that's what intrigues me about the Bundesliga coming back. They feel more confident based on statistics and data that they have, where they are. <clears throat> excuse me, we testing where they are with contract tracing. They are ba- doing this based on how efficiently they've attacked the virus. In the UK, in England, we have not attacked it very well. We were slow off the blocks. We've got this, the second highest death rate in the world. And I don't see a situation where the Premier League was starting next week. We could be any way which way confident that this is the right thing to do. Based on how we've dealt with things, you know, if you look at Korea, if you look at New Zealand, if you look at other countries around the world, most of them with uh, women leaders, by the way, just put that in there. It's like, it's, it's incredible. The inefficiency of some of the major countries compared to some countries, we have really attacked this properly, listened to advice and reacted without any hesitation at all. And really, I made a major, major gains. And so there's a different feeling in those countries about restarting because they know there's an elimination of the virus up to a certain point. Whereas we're in, we're not in that situation. Absolutely not. I, I really worry about this. I really do. I, I I worry about where this is heading. And and I think we're gonna in England we're gonna trip up a little bit mm. if we if we if we rush if we rush into easing the lockdown. Went out on my bike today, did a little bit of exercise for a couple of hours, and to me the lockdown's over. There's traffic back on the roads. Everyone's out. You know, I live near some big fields and parks, mobbed, absolutely yep. mobbed all day. And so we're talking a good game, but people's behaviours are changing and they're reverting back to what they used to be. And um, and I think we've, we've got a long road yet to go through. And uh, I, I'll stay with you on this, Clive, because like me, you live in the UK and I think your observations are exactly the same as mine. Yeah, I, I, when I, when I, it's difficult, isn't it? Because like you go out and you go out at a particular time of the day in your tiny little kind of corner of the world. And sometimes you can feel like, oh, there are a lot of people out there. That means like the whole country is just like completely fucked lockdown off when you yeah. might have just gone out at a particular time. And, and I've had like, over the last few weeks, I've gone out sometimes and been like, yeah, it's, it's deathly quiet. And then I've gone out a few times and thought, oh, it's a little bit busier. But like you, I don't know what it was, but yesterday I really felt like something changed. And I saw people like hugging in the street and stuff. And I saw like wow. people high fives and things like yeah. that. Like Especially people who clearly, people. Yeah, yeah, who hadn't seen each other for a while and have arbitrarily kind of decided that's it. Like I've, I've done this now. And um, like my my wife went um, this morning to to um, to see the midwife and all of that. And there's a park right next to um, this kind of makeshift hospital that's actually a library. And she wanted to go for a walk in the park, and she just said there were so many people, I couldn't do it. I like I couldn't keep my distance from people. And and I guess in the UK, um, there's like a political risk of rushing because we're a little bit behind the curve. And one of the things I think I worry about, and I'd like to get your view on this, is that the British government will start to look at other leagues coming back and go, oh, shit, we don't want to be behind. We don't want people watching Serie A and Bundesliga and saying, well, where's our Premier League? Because that might look back bad on the government. And and, and actually something the Foreign Secretary said, Dominic Raab, um, in this press conference, I think on Wednesday, he, he spoke again about the return of the Premier League potentially lifting people's spirits. Um, do you think it will? Do you think oh, that, like, that's... <laughs> it, dep- it, dep- it depends if Socrates is playing. <laughs> no, like, I, I, think think they're over, this... I, think, I think they're overplaying that, Tim. I really do. Yeah. I, I think they're overplaying it. I think they're getting that completely wrong. It felt like a good idea. You know, it was a nice thing to say a few weeks ago. But I don't know about you, but I, I like watching football with other people. I, I really do. I like I like going to my local football club. I like going to, going to the games. I like talking about the games, obviously, on the podcast. But I do. I have many podcasts in my local pub <laughs> outside of this. We're coming with a few of my mates, and um, for me, it's about bringing people together. So if, if even if it's on, yes, it'll be great to see a, a live game and talk about it. But it's not. We said this before. It's not the same game, is it? It's not the same thing. The, f- the flows of momentum that are built up through a crowd projecting onto the pitch, 
that's gonna that's gonna go. Um, there's not gonna be any sort of. It's just gonna be no sort of advantage. That's gonna go. I, I feel. I think we have to do something. I'm not being negative here. I think much we spoke about this the other day, didn't we? We, you know, we're we're going to go out to work at some point, and there won't be a cure. So we're going to go back, and we're going to get on trains, and we're going to get on buses, and we're going to travel to go to a meeting and go and do something. And there will not be a cure or a treatment. But we're going to learn, learn to live alongside something that's got potential, different potential for maybe all four of us on the, on this podcast. It's got different potential, and of causing real harm. Sorry, and. And I think we football is just another part of the world. It's another business, and it has to learn to live alongside this virus. Now, what that means for fans, what that means for football players, what that means for when we get that inevitable positive test, I think we have to be pragmatic, mature, and say, look, we're in a situation where we cannot sit in our hands for 18 months, so we have to live. And it's just how we live is going to be really important, how we feel about that, and how we react to the, the peaks and troughs of the bad news, which is going to continue to come our way. Yeah, I, th- I think that's another underrated kind of aspect when we talk about, you know, potentially lifting people's spirits. I mean, even if it does, even if like a very sterilised behind closed doors Premier League games in neutral venues really does lift people's spirits. And, 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 and I think it might um, a bit, to be fair. Um, you know, what if it all has to stop again? Like, what will that do to people's morale? Um, you know, if they feel lifted by the return of the Premier League, imagine if they, if like after two weeks it just doesn't work and they have to stop, how much of a psychological step backwards that will feel. Scott, um, I'm going to come to you and just and just let you have a crack at the kind of, um, I guess, where you are emotionally um, at the moment. Like, will you be tuning into the Bundesliga? Do you do you feel ready for that yet, or do you do you still feel that, um, you know, just from a strictly personal, subjective, emotional standpoint, that you're not really ready for football to come back yet? Um, well, I'm definitely excited for at least something because, you know, I wake up on the weekends. I'm a, an early person, so I'm usually the first person to wake in my house. So, um, you know, I get up, I come downstairs, and I you know I want to, you know, watch something on TV. And it feels like there's nothing on because, you know, normally my weekends are filled with watching, you know, football. Um, so it'll be nice to at least have that, um, you know, watching the Bundesliga was always kind of my, my second choice if, you know, the, the 7 a.m. kickoffs uh, weren't especially good in the Premier League. I would look to see what the, the 6.30 matches were in the Bundesliga, um, and those would usually be the, the, you know, kind of choose between those two. So um, I am excited for that. Um, it is a little bit weird to kind of see that, especially it's going to be um, a weird thing to see matches behind closed door because, you know, the fans are such a, a big part of you know the atmosphere. And, you know, I kind of got, you know, stick for saying this on Twitter the other day, but it's a big part of the product. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it adds a certain thing to what you're watching. You know, if it wasn't important, why would they have the microphones to be able to pick up all of that crowd noise or why would all of that? It's just it adds something and it, it feels a little bit weird um, when there isn't fans there. Like you're you're watching something. Um, I don't know. I, I've seen a lot of baseball games where, you know, like a, a stadium is, you know, 20 percent full or something like that. And it just feels weird. It feels different. Mm. It doesn't have the same kind of atmosphere and, you know, kind of importance. So I wonder if that's going to change things. But I bet that's something that you kind of get used to. Um, but it's still going to be a weird thing to see. But I'm excited to at least have something to fill my time um, because, you know, I've been you know, affected by. Uh, the lockdown thing. I'm I'm currently furloughed, so you know all of my days mm-hmm. feel a little bit weird. Where I, you know, every day kind of feels like a weekend. I don't know how to fill up my time. I have all of this extra time now, so I'm kind of on the opposite of everybody else. So I, I have so much time that I need something now to to fill it up. So I'm excited mm-hmm. to at least have that. Can I ask yeah. about something? Yes. Yeah. Go for it. Um, so, like when I was listen to, listening to our British mates here. Uh, it seemed really weird, uh, the world they're describing, that people are kind of beginning to act like there's no lockdown. And at- What's it like where you are? I'm in Chicago, obviously, and we are well and truly locked down, and people are treating each other like they got leprosy, which is great. Um, and, and, and we're beginning to uh, smooth out and flatten our curve a bit in Chicago. What's it like where you are? Um, so I, you know, in Nevada... Um, we are actually 
our, our lockdown is actually ending um, tomorrow at midnight. Wow. Um, we're actually so going into so starting that we are moving into what they're calling phase one. Um, so we have you know some um, reopening happening. Um, I think actually restaurants are opening with 50% capacity. That's the, the general kind of thing is everything is going to be a, about half capacity. Um, stores are still closed for the most part, you know, to just do like pickup and those kinds of things. But um, we've actually been in decline for about um, two weeks now. Mm. Um, so I think our peak was, um, you know, about the, the middle of April or so. Um, and because we actually locked down quite early, we have not been um, hit very hard. Um, so I think that's something that's yeah. pretty positive, at least for us. Um, I know I'd, I'd like to see our testing be up higher because they're, they're not doing enough of that. But um, that, overall, it's the seems analyst, to be good. That's analyst in you. So. Yes. But, uh, yeah, we're locked. The Midwest, Illinois, Michigan, etc., is locked down till the end of May now. So basically, everybody's shut in, locked down. So anyway, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I, th I think that's the really just interesting general point and something I've been really mindful of on social media is that everyone's experiencing this differently. Um, so, you know, being like, I, I think on balance, I'm slightly busier, maybe, but my weekends are not like my weekdays are slightly busier, though I'm really grateful. Like, I don't miss the commute at all. Um, but like my weekends are lacking a little bit um but you know I'm, I'm seeing like people on twitter say things like oh everyone's got a bit more time now and actually some people are much much busier um you know elliot case in point yeah um yeah. at the moment and My yeah you are yeah crazy. yeah 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 exactly and it's 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 kind of everyone's everyone's experiencing this slightly differently um paul i, I guess i want to come to you on a bit more of a fundamental um a mixture of the moral and the economic question mm. of um, Project Restart in the Premier League because it seems like the Premier League, well, it doesn't seem like the Premier League is starting to ramp up its preparations. Um, it, it feels like we're out of the stage of listing all of the problems um, and we're getting towards, you know, suggesting some solutions, um, which obviously just create more problems, which is all great fun. Um, I, I listened to um, the BT uh, Football Writers podcast last week. Um, they had Adrian Clark and Seb Stafford Bloor um, on to to. Uh, journalists broadcasters i've got a lot of respect for and you know when someone says something and you think actually that's really obvious a really obvious point but i hadn't thought of it mm. um before and adrian uh, was talking and he was you know he was talking uh, you know very sensibly about like the economic imperatives and when people say oh it's just about the money it's like well of course it is because people businesses need money otherwise they cease to exist that's like the way the world works and i think he was very sympathetic but a phrase he came out with really, really stuck with me when he was talking about like the return of the Bundesliga, for example, and training grounds opening. He said, if money didn't exist, if you took the economic part of it out, there is no way football would be talking about returning at the moment. Like it wouldn't even be a conversation. It would that would be parked until later in the year. Um, and so I, I guess what I, I want from what I want to ask you, Paul, is to what extent is there a distinction between what football and the Premier League is doing and the rest of the economy is doing? In your mind, is there a line here between the Premier League just being a bit insensitive and a bit greedy, or are you totally sympathetic to the idea that they just must do this to survive? Where do you come down on that? Um, I think, well, I certainly come down on the side of they kind of must do this. I don't know if it's to survive, but they kind of must do this. It is, this is a business. Um, and it's, the, it's a business of sport, but there are contracts, commitments, people are getting paid, huge amounts of money are moving around. Uh, it just happens to be a business we, that we really enjoy watching, hopefully. Um, I do think there's an imperative like the the exact timing and the exact how is another matter uh but if it's now mostly safe because it can't be 100 percent safe but nothing can be for anybody um but uh, i also think there are there are safety issues uh whether you for example just generally talking about lockdown versus not lockdown there's there's two sides to safety and we needed to do what we're doing right now. The, the timing when it ends is another matter. 
but you can't or it's not healthy for the economy for people for people's mental states to be home um to be isolated to be on their own for for life to change so much i mean life's kind of okay for me uh i'm mm. not miserable or unhappy but i could imagine circumstances in which uh me or somebody else could be in a very difficult situation right now so i do think there's there's imperatives from a number of standpoints points for things to start getting back to normal and football is absolutely no different it's it's very much the stuff of life um and football at the top level is it is a business and it's an economic business in which money flows down through the leagues and through the organizations and down into the grassroots and people need things to do and they need so you may not think me football is necessarily meaningful but it is and depending on where you're at in life it has a lot of meaning for you um mm. and the money from the premier league goes down to the leagues below it and down into grassroots and you can argue it should be more but it's still a lot of money flows down and the money that goes out to professional footballers that they spend and to the organizations and to through the communities uh from football tax tax etc mm. etc uh, it's absolutely a business. Now, should it start in June versus July versus September? I don't know. But this idea that we'll cancel football and, and, you know, we won't be able to play it next year either because of this, that or the other. I mean, if that's if we look hard at it and we decide football can't be played for the next 18 months because it's such a huge risk. OK, I, I mean, I'm open to that, but that's not the way I lean. I think we've got to. Uh, very soon work out how teams can play football and move forward and test the snot out of everybody. And uh, and I hear the arguments that you can't pull a single test away from the NHS or from this or that or the other. Um, I don't know that I 100%... Uh, no, uh, I've nothing against the, the idea that the NHS should be supported and funded, but I really think we've got to start gearing up to moving forward in each aspect of life and they work together mm. and football is important and the, the business of football is important to people's livelihoods and uh, I mean uh, uh, my own personality type comes into this I'm I'm not particularly risk averse I I'm not a worrier so that's always going to be part of how I feel about it but yeah I'm ready I'm uh, I think we should having done due diligence to work out that now is the time versus two, three months away. And again, that's kind of doing your homework, uh, understanding the implications and the risks and and considering the, the backup plans for if suddenly there are outbreaks and you know teams are coming down with stuff and having plans to deal with all contingencies. So having done all our homework, yeah, I'm ready to move forward. And I think there's an ethical and moral imperative to do so when it's reasonably safe. There are no absolutes. It'll never be 100% safe. Mm. Yeah, and, and Clive, I, I want to come to you on this because I know this is um, a discussion you and I have had quite a bit, um, you know, off mic, actually, quite a lot in recent weeks. You know, we've been talking about how everyone's workplaces are going to look different very, very soon. Um, you know, shift, like if you work in an office, shift working. Uh, just taking London as an example, they are not, we are not going to go from, um you know, everyone's working from home to right. Everyone get back on the train at eight o'clock in the morning and get in at nine o'clock in the morning and pack into your offices and everything like that's not going to happen. There's going to be, you know, something phased. And, and so football, you know, is going to look very different because of the economic economic imperative for it to come back. Um, and what we've seen in the UK, Clive, is um, a lot of kind of football has <laughs> become a political football. So you've got Dominic Raab's comments there about the Premier League lifting people's spirits. A couple of weeks earlier, the health secretary kind of applied some pressure on Premier League players to, you know, to kind of contribute more to the NHS than they already do through their taxes. And, and so football's kind of been singled out. And like lots of people are talking about football like it isn't a business that needs to plan for its return like every other business. But 
you know we talk about like offices looking different and things like that that that's possible that's the art of the possible you can socially distance in an office you can shift work you can take the pressure off public transport you can do things to the football environment to make it you know play behind closed doors neutral venues etc cetera, etc cetera. but when it comes down to it on the pitch you can't socially distance you can't get away from 22 people sweating and spitting and running alongside each other and grabbing each other's shirts and all of that so t- to what extent clive do you think that football has you know could and should be singled out to what extent is it distinct um from business or do you think it's just completely unfair that it's been you know it's been singled out in this way football uh, it's, it's the world's game according to me that is right so if you support nfl then maybe you don't think that way and um but really if you think about the different regions in the world a lot of the world play football and so I'm looking at our TV figures, for example, on BT and Sky. Those numbers are not really going up. And Tim, we have a big debate about VAR and what the game's doing to itself and, and you know, late changes of games. But I feel as though football was really, really close to eating itself. Right? Mm. It really was, in my opinion. And I, I know you've got a separate interest in the, in the ladies' game. And I've got a separate interest in the, in the, in the non-league game. And I put, and it coexists alongside Arsenal. So I, I was already, in my mind, I also watch every minute of every Arsenal game, but I was trying to almost protect myself because I get so annoyed about certain things that are happening about the game and, and about the team and the club. So if I overly emotionally invest in it, I'm worried what it do for for my sanity. So I diversify my football and it helps me to learn, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I really think, you know, with the, with the money's a good angle, right? We've got 750 million quid we owe. So we have to try to, to do something. And, you know, the Premier League's got a four, 4.4 billion pound deal for its seven packages that it sold. So we're talking about a lot of money and a lot of investment that have been forward planned for four or five years. So we're really in a situation where we are in bed with the TV. We, and so we have no choice. We have no choice. There will be, unless we want to see David Hilliers and Ian Sellies running around our midfield against him, this is like, this is what we're going to have, right? So, because that's what we used to have. We used to have a game where the wages weren't astronomical and we had good old local lads playing in our first team and we loved them. We absolutely loved them. You know, Steve Morrow, we go through a list of them and they were good, solid pros that played for us and won medals for us, right? So, so that those days have gone. It's a global game, and we are committed. We are committed, and so we are committed to to coming back. And again, I said earlier, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what the German game, any game, looks like, to see if it looks like the game that we know and love. And and, and that to me is going to be so interesting to how they can build these players to a psychological pitch. They can actually play the game, you know, because they're like us. They're watching the news. They're watching. The news rolling around. They're watching these daily briefings. They're watching. They're online. They're watching all these different theories and etc. And they must be confused. They must be massively. Con- or the word is conflicted. Actually, they must be conflicted, knowing that they are. They have to go out there and give it a go, but also wondering if it's okay to give it a go. And you know, I don't want to get political, but. Um, you know, I wouldn't. I wouldn't believe Dominic Raab, right? Do, do you see what I mean? And I wouldn't believe. And the, and the people that we've got in charge are really not inspiring confidence. But you have to find your confidence, and that's going to be in your doctors, in your coaches, and they have to make you believe. And I'm you know, listening to David Ornstein this week. There's a lot of worry from the Premier League doctors. There's a lot of worry about what is safe, what is the right thing to do. So there just needs to be a little bit of a breath and everyone can have a look at Germany and see how they approach it and see the backlash, see how the public feel about it. I feel we shouldn't be rushing back before we have a good look at um, what they do. Although I do hear there's a, there's a, there's a mid-June date being thrown around, I've heard. And, um, and it'd be interesting to see if that sticks and starts to really you know, be a roadmap to us really coming back for real going forward. 
Yeah, and one of one of the things I'd read about the Bundesliga actually is that that it's not quite as oh, it's just you know because we're fine uh, and everything's great over here that that actually. Um, you know, Germany are, are kind of grappling with the contract issue and they're basically thinking maybe this is a bit too early, but we've got a window here and we can get this done before the contract issue um, comes up. And perhaps if that issue weren't there or if contracts ran till July the 30th or August the 30th, the feeling is the Bundesliga, even the Bundesliga might wait a month or two Um but I, I think it's quite understandable that, that that's a really big issue. And that's one we'll talk about in a minute. But Clive, I want to stay with you before I move on to Scott. Um, and, and I guess because you hit on something really important there about, um, you know, kind of maintaining your sanity and things that have annoyed you about watching elite level football that I know have annoyed me about watching elite level football. And one of the things I've been really observing on social media is is like the level of cynicism every time something comes out like um oh they're looking into 80 minute games which which to me makes some sense to explore that issue uh you know not I, whether you do it or not is another thing but of course they have to have that conversation or you know the five subs or neutral venues or behind closed doors every time one of these suggestions comes out everyone goes oh this is ridiculous this is idiotic the premier league's like you know shame 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 and, uh, and and I get that. I like I really understand why people feel like that. But I've I've been looking at it and I've been thinking there are a lot of people, I think, that would just be a lot happier without this in their lives because it just really <laughs> seems to be like quite a negative force that they feel really badly about. And to what extent, if assuming you've observed that reaction as well, to what extent do you think that that is the case that so many people are just so jaded and would probably honestly be happier without it, but just feel locked into it um or to what or or is that just like a natural kind of aversion to change or the fact that people either haven't quite or don't want to quite grip how this virus is going to change things over the next year or two where do you set that reaction or do people (laughs) like to bitch yeah yeah Yeah, i mean it could be that could be that I've got a couple of theories on this. You knew I would. <laughs> I always think it's like uh, you're about to have your first child, right? And so, and many, I was. It's almost like having having a baby, right? Because when you're having a baby and you, and, and your partner, your wife is there screaming, saying, "Get away from me! Get away from me! Never again! Never again!" You have the baby. Within about six months, time, you're thinking, you know what? I'd love another one. Do you know what I mean? And then that's how it goes. You you you're bitching, you moan, and you moan, and you moan. And then, as soon as it's, as soon as you get used to it, the, the the memory of what used to happen, how you used to feel, goes away. The moment the game kicks off, and you get excited, you got a couple of Cronenbergs in you. All that rubbish goes, right? All that rubbish goes, and and you're you're back in love with it again, and you're after the, you're after, you're just back in love, and, you, and 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 nothing would is more important to you for those for those ninety minutes. I do think though, fandom is develop. I think it develops with with age and maturity. I think it's almost like there's a period in your life where you are, we all love the game, but I think there's a period in your life where you're massively head over, over hills in love with the game. You know? And there's a difference. You know? I used to, me and, me and you, Tim, talk about, for example, Aaron Ramsey, right? Let's talk about, let's take for example. And I sort of, I look back and I, and I realise for, for some people that player represents a period in their life where they were young, they could go every single week, they could really invest emotionally, less distractions, less family ties. They can absolutely 1,000% go to the football, and it really means everything to them. And if there's a player in that period which you really like, he is, he's massive to you. You know what I mean? He's massive to you. Now, you know, I used to love Patrick Vieira. He was my period where, where I was absolutely in love with the game. 30-plus games a season, home and away, Europe the lot. It was everything. And I've matured and I'm less enamoured with all the players these days. I look at it in a slightly different way. While respecting other people's um, views and loves and dislikes, for example. And I do think fandom is almost like it's almost like a relationship. There's a period where you are really hot for it. And there's a period when you're a little bit more pragmatic and phlegmatic about the football. It doesn't mean you're not in love. It just means it's a different type of love. And I think we just have to be mature and digest that and say, well, you know what? You know, I guarantee you, Arteta has brought back a big bit of love for me for the, for the football. He really has. Just just by listening to him and, and 
I, I like to admire people in the club, and I've lost a bit of that. I didn't admire them. I didn't look up to them. And I see this guy come in, and I really admire him. He's at a period of his life, he's in his prime working years, to make his life, to make his career. And I hope we're going to be a beneficiary of where he is in his life cycle of football. And I really believe we are. So I'm now, I'm now back emotionally because I want to, I want to track this guy. I want to watch him develop. I want to watch him develop the connection between the fans and the club. I want to watch him develop a team. I'm not sure how he's going to go, but I trust him. And I think that's just the peaks and troughs of, um, of watching and loving the game, mate. Did did you watch uh, his interview? Have you watched his interview with Ian Wright? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah, yeah, really good. It's really good, isn't it? Right. And yeah, yeah. He's, so how did he's, he make you feel? Simple yeah, as that, right? exactly. I, I always think, um, you know, when I listen to him, I think I, I hope the players feel like I feel when I hear him talk. Because when I hear him talk, I think I'd follow you off a cliff. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd, and it, it's it's not it well it is important, but it's not hugely important for me to think that's what the players think and if the players feel like that like I feel really enthused by that um Scott I want to I want to come to you and uh, and move the conversation on a little bit uh to some of the practicalities um and specifically integrity like the integrity question right because I think we're at a stage now where the absolute integrity of the Premier League is is out the window uh the integrity of the season rather um e- even if like you know we had a was it was it which show was it was it Dallas or was it Dynasty that had like the big um someone died and then it was really unpopular <laughs> so about six episodes Dallas, it was it was Ewing. Dallas wasn't it yeah yeah, yeah that's it that's it it was all a dream so, he was having a shower it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's it. I got there in the end, but like imagine like um, you know, we had that with like coronavirus. It was it was just like some kind of TV plot and it all just disappeared tomorrow and we could go back to how the Premier League was. Even then, I think the integrity of the season is damaged irreparably, but we're in a world of looking for the least worst scenario at the moment, right? So, you know, some of the some of the things they're talking about that look really likely, like neutral venue, like behind closed doors is something I think we've all accepted. But, you know, neutral venues, for example, um, they're talking about managing the players' fitness. And there's one idea for, for having five subs, which seems to benefit the bigger teams. Or you can yeah, play for 80 minutes. I think that was just approved today. Yes, it was by IFAB, yeah, because the the discussion they were having before that was about having 80-minute games, which seems to me it would benefit the smaller teams who want to kind of play for nil-nil, and particularly those in the bottom six, and that's a difficult judgment to make. So where do you stand on the kind of the integrity um, of the Premier League? Like, do you think it's so far gone that it's almost not worth bothering with, um, or you know, like, like for example, neutral venues behind closed doors, is that just something we're just going to have to swallow? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of these, it's pick the least worst option out of all of them. Um, I don't really love, you know, the the League One approach or, you know, the, the League Un. Um, let's try to do some French there. Um, <laughs> because, you know, the, the season wasn't actually finished. Um, so I think, you know, they're actually going through and saying this is what's done. Um, that's I don't think that's particularly fair. Um, you know, a lot of things can change over the last, you know, you know, I guess it's like a third or, you know, a quarter of a season left or so. I think mm. most of the leagues have gone through about, you know, 26, you know, game weeks or so. Um, so there's a there's still quite a bit can change in that little bit. Um, I, so that is not really a good option. Um, you know, playing behind closed doors or in neutral venues, the, you know, the whole idea of, you know, the, the home field advantage, um, it's hard to, to quantify, but we do know that that's a, a real thing. And, you know, losing that really, you know, hurts. So, you know, if you had more home matches left, you know, you are going to be at a disadvantage. Or if you had more away matches, you know, you're going to be at an advantage now. You know, this is easier than what it was. Um, the whole thing, you know, with, you know, a month off or two months off, um, that's going to, you know, make things all different. But then you also have the idea of, you know, the teams in the the lower leagues, you know, the the promotion, you know, um, you, how well they were doing before, you know, they were planning on getting up into, you know, their finances on moving up. So can you really penalize them? It, the whole thing is, uh, you know, trying to figure out what is the least worst, what is the, you know, the most fair for everything that's going on. 
Um, you know, the whole idea with the contracts as well. It's like, how mm-hmm. how do you go through and manage those? Do you, when the transfer window supposedly is going to open, you know, do can people move teams? You know, especially now, you know, you think about, um, you know, the Air Divisi is done. Chelsea have already signed a player from there. You know, if, you know, things go through and, you know, he can actually be a Chelsea player starting on, what, July 1st? You know, can, mm. is he allowed to be able to do that? Like, where do these kinds of things all go through? And it's trying to figure out what is the least disruptive, what makes the most sense. Um, because, you, you know, you also don't want to necessarily, you know, say that everything is null and void because you've played, you know, more than half of the season already. And, you know, things have happened. So I, I kind of lean towards this is probably the least worst way. Um, you know, let's let's do the, you know, behind closed doors if it's safe. Let's just try to finish it out. You know, everything, everybody knows that this is going to be a little bit weird, but I think that's probably the most fair and least worst of what we have. Oh, you want to come in on that? Yeah, so um, on the, does it delegitimize um, the season to some extent? Maybe it's just my perverse nature, but I kind of like that whole aspect of it, the the kind of bad-tempered slapping the Monopoly board and throwing all the pieces up in the air because you didn't like how the game was, was shaking out because you were losing, but everybody knew who was going to win. Well, everybody knows who's going who's gonna to win. Um, in a weird way, I like the fact that Liverpool have fairly and squarely demonstrated beyond a shadow of a doubt that they were going to win the league and that uh, they are the rightful title winners. Now, I know everybody has different relationships with Liverpool, Scousers, uh, the enemy, um, the enemy of this season, etc. But there is, they, there's no two ways about it. That manager, that team, uh, this season, they 100% deserve it and nobody no matter what happens, even if they play like utter dog shit and just fall over the line from this standpoint, they've won this league and they are, they've they earned it. So everything mm. else is down to kind of who deserved to be relegated and who deserves second, third and fourth and blah, blah. I kind of like the fact that, you know, I wasn't actually enjoying the league this year. The the one and the this run in for the season was not too exciting. And it like I was ready for next season already. Um, but here's this whole new thing um, where the game is kind of... Now we're trying to remember where the pieces were on the board, so everybody's calmed down and we're, we'll kind of start again. But it's kind of like switching to speed chess. Uh, there are going to be different problems, different challenges. And if they can create the connection to the game and the games and the players... like I actually think there's a real opportunity here in the short term with no crowd. I mean, one option would be like a, a laughter track on a comedy show. You know, you know it's you know it's a fake laughter track, but after a while you forget about it and you, you get to enjoying the jokes in the show and forget that the laughter track is fake. Well, they could have a fake crowd noise and after a little while we'd probably kind of get used to it if they were if they were good at it. But the other option is the stadium's going to be deathly quiet. You can hear everything. You can never hear everything. If they lean into that, if they get cameras in new positions, if they get microphones, um, imagine the conversations you're going to pick up. Imagine hearing everything Mikel Arteta shouts and when. Uh, Imagine uh, kind of picking up uh, all the voices from the bench, shouting at their own team, kind of cheering uh, that whole aspect of it and then the conver- you know the the shouting the communication on the pitch i mean it'll be different it won't be a replacement for what it was but mm. i think there's a way of creating a connection to this game if if they lean into it where yeah it's going to feel weird but you're going to get the kind of access it's kind of like that um, i don't know what they call that view but where you you start getting different angles uh, uh, of the match available to you online you can take a top down view you know you can kind of control your own view of the pitch suddenly you're getting information you never got before um and if they turn on the microphones and point them at people if they point them at the center back shouting at each other or or telling each other giving each other a rollicking or the communication within players. I mean, it won't be forever, but we'd have one month where we're going to get a whole view of the football in a different way. So those two aspects of it could make it 
very engaging for, you know, I, I probably won't care about other teams shouting at each other and the, the communication between players, but I'd be dead interested to see what goes on, what players actually say to each other. I mean, we'd actually be able to hear what Luis Suarez said to uh, <laughs> uh, what's his face, Patrice Evra. Pa- Patrice Evra, in uh, in uh, and make up our own minds about it. It could be quite interesting. I I would surmise. I, I think one of the things um, that that's quite and it's understandable, right? Because it's it's something not many people have experienced. But behind closed doors football how it changes your perception of what's happening mm. when there's when there's no crowd i'll give you a good example like i i have people say to me all the time that they think the women's game is is much much slower than the men's yeah. it's it, it is a, a bit it's not as much as people think that what governs that perception is the low crowds yeah. the fact that there isn't like there aren't like thirty thousand people screaming and swearing that really creates the perception that it's not as intense um, and actually, when people come to watch something like the Women's World Cup, where there are thirty, forty thousand fans shouting, people are like, "Ah, oh, actually, this this is a, you know this is more intense than I thought." And it's it's amazing how much that governs your perception. Um, Scott, I want I want to come back to you on um, you know on, fairly quickly. Let's let's say, for example, that the Premier League um, comes to a position where it cannot restart this season, and we're in like you know Eredivisie France territory. I, I don't think that's going to happen because they had different broadcasting situations going on that, that govern some of those situations. But let's say we get to like I don't know end of May, beginning of June, and there's just no prospect of restarting the Premier League. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about statistical modelling. <laughs> to to what extent um, do you think like points per game would be? Obviously, again, we're looking at least worse, and none of this is really fair. Do Do you think there's a superior, perhaps, statistical option to points per game being well, the mean, side of the table? Yeah, I mean, you you could probably definitely look at different models that would actually kind of simulate things to try to get a better idea because you know with the the points per game it's going to be affected by the matches that you've played um teams that have played a a harder schedule or or have played you know more home games versus away games um that is definitely going to go into things so you know those are that doesn't make points per game a perfect measure um for you know just saying this is the the final thing on how things are going to or should end um you know that's something that isn't necessarily going to be perfect as well. So um, there's lots of different ways that you could do it. Um, I don't know if you could get everybody to agree on how that would work. I, I imagine that would just be a, a major headache to try to figure out, um, you know, saying this is this is what we're going to use and have everybody buy into it. So I think somebody's going to be mad no matter which method you choose. Mm-hmm. But but it needs to be a really simple measure, and it needs to be a gold standard. That's the problem with um, models that would predict, because you get you get into all sorts of arguments. Plus, it's the future, and it's it's fa- fantasy versus historical reality. So, I mean, something like points per game is an ugly measure, uh, extremely imperfect, but on the other hand, very fair because everybody because it's actually how the sport works points per game that's what you were trying to do so unfair but very simple and a gold standard of a measure i don't it's in, it'd be interesting to find anything that compares to it as a measure that everybody can say oh yeah i get that i don't like it but i get it gold difference per game yeah but yeah but gold difference per game how would that work basically look at your, your it's basically ranking things on goal difference instead of points um you know because the you know you still kind of think about the the sure, overall but, but teams don't compete based on trying to get the best goal difference they do try and compete to get most but, you know the the, the, the overall yeah i mean so you know you're you are trying to win or you know at least not lose um the way you do that is by scoring goals so that is something that I think would actually balance out a it's little bit really, more. Or, it's not really. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it is. So I think let me defend it a little bit more. Um, so I think that would help balance out a little bit more the strength of schedule stuff. Um, so if you played a you know a, a hard game, 
um, you know, that would kind of help things out. And, you know, in general, um, goal difference, um, you know, lies less than points. So you could find a model that's that's more accurate, but that's that's a model. It's not actually the objective. The objective was maximum number of points per game. I, I don't disagree. That is, if the, your the goal difference goal. at the end of the year was one point, you wouldn't care too much if you won the league because you'd have maximized your points. That that's the objective of a number of games: maximizing points. But you well, know, the, also the the strategy wasn't also let's have the most points after you know twenty eight matches. No, well, <laughs> either way, so either way, either yeah, yeah. So either way, but at least one, one of them answer. was the defined objective: maximize points. I mean, I, I guess individual games are decided on goal difference, aren't they, essentially? And that's what governs the, the awarding of points. So, it yeah, is, but it's, once it's... you average goal difference, then, then you're assessing performance rather than results. And, you know, it isn't a yeah, beauty true. competition. You're not scoring performances. You're scoring results. Uh, that would be my take. That's why, ultimately, it has to be a measure of results, not ancillary things that lead to results. Fair enough. Um, Clive, I'm, I'm going to come to you on something different just to move the discussion al along again. Um, and that's to talk Good like, <laughs> but th th this is to talk about like the politics. And I don't mean um, the governmental politics. I'm in the Premier League politics. And we're reading, you know, if you're reading David Ornstein stuff in The Athletic at the moment, um, which is like really, really good, really well sourced and detailed, as you'd expect from David. Um, you know, we're getting a lot of kind of this split between the bottom six and the rest of the Premier League, which which, which is understandable. And of course, there is a level of self-interest, um, you know, even both consciously and unconsciously. Um, and there's a sense perhaps that the bottom six are stalling a little bit. Um, because, uh, you know, there, there's some and I want to be careful about kind of demonizing the bottom six because it's not like the top six have been a, a fantastically positive force for the Premier League. But, you know, there's some suggestion that maybe the bottom six are just kind of stalling things a little bit and they're kind of um, they're very forthcoming with problems, but not solutions. And uh, there's some suggestion that maybe they're just trying to put things on ice until it comes to the stage where. Um, the league can no longer be restarted because maybe they feel like there's less chance they'll be relegated. Um, and I guess, and because they've made the calculation that even losing the broadcast revenue is a better economic scenario for them than being relegated. And there's all these kind of politics um, going on at the moment. And, and then, you know, how does that impact the future relationship when the top six, if the top six feel diddled by the bottom six basically and then we come to like the next tv deal you know how do how does you know the the top six might then say well come on you got you guys did us over um on the restart so we're 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 not doing the collective bargaining anymore what what are your kind of um i, I guess to what extent is this understandable and to what extent is this like just a bit morally <laughs> despicable i guess this this kind of level of self-interest in the in the politics of all of these arrangements yeah, we like to we talk, we spoke about the game earlier being the community game and you know watching it in a group and watching it together etc but when it comes down to it it's a massive business and um, run by different owners global owners we've got chinese owners we've got saudi arabian owners coming in we've got gulf states in, in the, we've got roman abramovich we've got american owners we've got everything in the premier league and they are expecting to make some money at some point and the way they were going to make that was when we finally had a TV deal that took the numbers into a, a stratosphere, which is beyond the TV deal we have in the subscription model we have today. And so these lower teams who have built their clubs up to get to the top 20 in, the, in England, they are hanging in there because they know there's a gravy train around the corner. And so they have got a massive self-interest. And But I do think there's going to be a backlash. Like, I think... You look at football as a business, it's going to want to recover. But then there's going to be a period of, okay, that's how you are. You've shown your true colours. Okay, well, the power brokers in the top six are still the power brokers in the league. They are going to react at some point. I firmly believe that. They're going to react. They're going to be far more stringent on things like the overseas deal, 
why is that shared shared equally at the moment when no one really wants to see Bournemouth in, in, in Taiwan, for example. No one wants to see that. They want to see the top six teams. So why are the top six teams not getting a greater share of that money? That's just one thing that comes straight to mind. The collective bargaining agreement, I, I can see that potentially changing at some point. And you might think, well, actually, what about the competition of the league? Well, when it comes down to it, people are going to start caring more about themselves and what, what that's going to actually mean. So I I think we're just seeing people reacting to a massive hole in the balance sheet without fans also looking at 96 million to 100 million. Without the TV deal, without the season completing, it's a £750 million pound hole without TV season completing. These numbers are just scary numbers. They are massively scary. And with no date when everything's going to get back to normal. You know, so, so yeah, I think it puts the football at the behest of the TV companies. I think things that the TV companies wanted to bring in, uh, they're just going to be able to do it because football's weak. So things like, you know, interviews in the dressing room, um, advertisements during after the first quarter. Dare I say that word, quarter? Um, <laughs> these things could all they could all happen. They could all happen. And what are you going to say? What can football say? They're not in a strong position. They're not going to be able to put on a product that they used to put on. And so they're going to be. They're going to actually have to say yes to these things. Although I do think five subs is a great idea, by the way. So, uh, But I think they're going to have to say yes, and it's going to completely change the game that we're watching. Now, some people are going to... You know, some people are not going to believe in Highbury, for God's sake, right? So some people are going to... They're going to massively go crazy about this. But actually, it's coming. The change in the game is coming. The change in what's the structure of the game is coming. The rules of the changes are coming because VAR's going to participate in some rule changes. How we consume the game is going to change. You know, we can see a, a Premier League app or a Netflix type scenario coming where you buy a season ticket, get your arse on that, buy your season ticket, and watch every single game on your phone. It's coming. It's coming, and it's going to come now because the numbers are the best way to recover. And recover the game back to where it used to be. So sit back, hold on, open your mind up because it's all on the table. Absolutely everything on the table. Tim, do you remember the 39th game discussion we had a few yep. years ago? Yes, yeah. The reaction was like, oh my God, that's just no chance. No way, no way. Hardly any, anybody yeah. said anything about it. We mentioned things like B-teams a little while ago when they tried to create some depth to make sure we didn't have a blockage with the, with the players in the league. i tell you what, B-teams are back on because those lower league teams, yeah. they're going to be thinking, oh, well, I need to get myself next to a, a, a top team, keep my financials coming up. B-teams are on, 39th games are on, playing games abroad are on. It's all on and we need to open up our minds and maybe embrace it because that's maybe the quickest way back to normalcy. And uh, I, I'm kind of glad um, you, you kind of brought up like uh, the whole pyramid because I, I just want to spend a couple of minutes on that as well and kind of get your reflections, Clive, on like um, – because cause I think there's a, there's a real distinction. There are real distinctions coming out here. Like League One and League Two are fucked, <laughs> basically, and yeah. it's, it's going to be a struggle for them to survive because there's no TV money there. And they can't play behind closed doors, and they're going to have to let players go. And 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 I think what you've touched on there is like quite a few things that were probably coming anyway might just come a bit quicker. And one of the things there's been a bit of a debate about in the football league is obviously England has a massive football league, bigger than I think anywhere else in the world, with the kind of four professional divisions. And there's already been some debate about how far that's sustainable, and and obviously that's coming. And I just want to draw out some some stuff I read in one of David's articles, particularly in the championship, like because the championship is economically. You know, it's a basket case because everyone's trying to get into the Premier League. So the average championship club spends one pounds and six pence for every one pound of revenue on wages. Leeds currently have a player on eighty thousand pounds a week. The average championship squad size is thirty seven players. <laughs> So, you know, wow. you've got to think that there's change coming from the championship and even lower down, like maybe they'll region. There's talk of regionalizing leagues. There's talk of salary caps. How do you see like the rest of the structure below the Premier League looking? 
Yeah, well, uh, Rev, um, fans coming through the door is everything. Lower down, obviously, and to play these games, it actually costs you money. It costs you money, and they can't play them without without fans coming through the door. So there is a greater connection to the local fan lower down the league, and so that's been taken away. So your revenue stream has gone. So on June the 30th, I'm not sure percentile of players are going to be out of contract, but it's a, it's a big number. Normally, that's like a, a no-brainer. They'll be back in a good majority of them. It's just a way that the lower league teams don't commit to the five-year contracts in the same way that they're doing the Premier League. So it's going to be a huge amount of footballers unemployed. And if they're going to be going into, into other teams that are going to be able to offer them no stability because they've got no revenue. So that situation is absolutely scary so you're going to have players just floating around not sure where to go what teams to go to what's the most fancy stable to go to so they're going to have to find another way i thought going there was something brilliant the other day about if you're a smart footballer now you'd be educating yourself and building yourself for your next career because you may have to be working alongside your football and i thought that was so such foresight and thought and he's just such a smart guy, that guy. And I think this is what's going to happen lower down. People's ambitions are going to be completely taken away. And I just, I find that, you know, really challenging. So I, I live near um, two local teams, Luton and Stevenage, and um, and I worry about them. Stevenage are bottom of League Two. So, yep. you know, potentially, I think there were a bit of issues with Macclesfield the other day. So they're only they're two points off, I think, with a game in hand. So they may not have gone down, right? So Luton were bottom of the championship, so they were heading down. They've got a new ground that's potentially being built. That momentum has has gone. And there are many clubs that are building themselves, building momentum to try to push themselves up the leagues that have been taken away. When I was listening to Scott and Paul talk about their mathematical models, I don't know if there's a model, Scott, for momentum. You know, we had it. We had momentum. as The Arsenal had it. We had it. Burst didn't, for example. Now it's all been reset. So integrity is gone. The integrity of the pyramid has completely been taken away. It really has. So we, re- I keep saying that we have to breathe, open up our minds, and say, actually, it's not going to sue everybody. No one's going to be happy. Many clubs are going to fold, or they're going to fold. Or they, how should I say? Many clubs, they may not fold, but they're going to be different. And maybe there's a situation where some of those leagues it might be better for them to just not do anything for a year. Just sit. Mm. Don't do anything. Mothball for a year. Just say, there's no point in playing because we can't get anybody in. We can't get revenue over the bar. We can't do anything. So the same for non-league lower down, the club I, look, I, I work with, their revenue comes from the bar, comes from social events, comes from mass gatherings. If there's no mass gatherings, there's, there's no revenue. So we can't pay players. And, and that's not the only one. Every, once you go out of the conference, it's the same all the way down. That's how clubs are run. And so this is all being challenged right now. So none of this is short term. It's medium to long term. And, and science is going to cure it. But I tell you, the, the pyramid, I mean, driving around the motorways on Saturdays in England, is just a, it's a joy because there's so many different scars you see going to different parts of the country. It's just incredible. It's incredible about depth of loyalty of fans going from different parts of the country. That's going to change, and that's a real shame, but it is what it is for the next year to 18 months. And, uh, Paul, I, I, wanna, I, I don't think we can do this without talking about the contract issue, so I want to come to you on that, because I know you've got a hard stop in nine minutes, um, so if you kind of need to go subsequently, that's absolutely fine. Um, but I kind of want to touch on the contract issue because it feels like there are starting to be some developments here on the issue of contracts running out. Um, and like I said earlier, like the Bundesliga are a big part of the reason they're kind of rushing their restart is to get around that problem. But um, again, David Ornstein's article in The Athletic was kind of detailing some of the options that are on the table. And and this is also really difficult, right, because there's a distinction between football and actual contract law um, here. And so some of the options they're floating are about uh, for players who are out of contract on June the 30th, because, again, there's also the question of, well, are they just allowed to join another team on July the 1st and start playing for them, even though the season might not be over? Um, but they're, they're, they're talking about options like a, con- a contract extension until the current season is over with kind of added insurance um, options, because most players don't like 
signing short-term contracts because of the risk of injury and things like that. Again, I, I don't really know how you do that in contract law, like an, an, an as-yet-to-be-determined date. Um, you know, some players might just sign a year contract and just say, OK, fine, I'll just sign for another year and we'll see where we are next year. Um, or, you know, just letting kind of letting it be a bit more lawless and just letting players run their contracts down on June the 30th and turn out for other teams on July the 1st. How like how do you see this going? And, and there are loads of other options in there, like they're thinking of relaxing the loan market, maybe to prop up some of the lower league clubs. So allowing Premier League players to go to go on loan a, a bit more and perhaps separating out the transfer windows so there's a domestic one and an international one how how do you see this this shaking out in the next few months uh, well it's an incredibly complex um environment which i'm totally unqualified <laughs> to talk about <laughs> but don't let that stop me i don't i don't have any hard thoughts of it. there are going to be some clubs who are incredibly well positioned in all of this they got shit loads of money uh, possibly owned by a state somewhere in the middle east um or a a a, a a very unkindly but kindly oligarch so deep pockets uh ready to hoover up every opportunity and roll with all the punches but uh and small clubs i think are going to be screwed what kind of whatever happens um mm. Whether they keep things exactly the way they are or they don't, they're, they're going to get screwed either way because they just won't have the internal resources within their organization. Like you need staff to be. Remember back in the day when it was Dick Law and and one mm. or two people behind him from an admin standpoint, and like now we have whatever six seven hundred employees at Arsenal, etc. Well, if if you're a I, I don't actually remember what the number is, but it, it's a substantial number of employees at Arsenal and those bigger clubs. And you need the bandwidth to be able to roll with whatever the punches are. Um, I don't know what the answers are. It's, it, it seems if we extend the season by an extra month or so that the best thing for everybody is to just roll everything another month or so. Um, but I, I could imagine once you get into the details, you start hitting backstops uh, from other directions that make that actually quite complex um, to roll everything on a year or to turn it into the wild west where everybody it, it's basically everybody starts turning into some kind of some variant of a free agent acting on their own how they get any kind of decision between clubs players um, and agents who can never agree in the simplest of environments without having three months of a a kind of a Mexican standoff on every individual item, let alone group decisions. I think it's going to be a mess. So probably the solution is going to be something of a mess. It's not. They either all decide that they will just roll everything forward for an additional month or so, and the. But you know, you immediately start seeing problems with that. Well, does that mean the next? period is 11 months away or 12 months away um, mm. so I could imagine it gets real complex really quick but what's interesting will be who will have the resources well financially we know who will benefit it'll be United, it'll be City it, it, it'll be Chelsea I think financially some of the, the 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 bodies the UEFA, FIFA, Premier League watching things like uh, financial fair play or any financial guidelines will kind of have to step back and let the wild west happen because uh it would just be you know when you move all the goalposts it, it's like what rules were people supposed to be sticking to so i think it gives clubs like your cities a free hand to do whatever the heck it is they want to do and to clean up and um uh, that's from a financial standpoint and then those same clubs will have the bandwidth the resources the admin the contract people uh, to roll with the punches raul's connections and relationships will be of help um mm. cl clubs who are well connected and can make things happen and who can work with agents um and have the resources to back it up will do well so and we do have i know we have 170 or 160 million in cash in in the bank 
that we have never used for anything and we probably have our reasons for having it there it makes sense we're not we're not the worst positioned club in the world in terms of having a bank balance even if we've never seen fit to deploy it uh but again it's kind of like throwing that board up in the air and put uh putting the having to put the pieces back i think the rules would be different it'd be like switching from chess to speed chess different clubs will be uh better positioned than other clubs it's a whole new game and um, it'll be interesting to watch yeah yeah and um you know probably in in closing scott just um i, I guess kind of just quickly like how um how do you see this changing things like in terms of you know how contracts operate in football because it, it, surely it's going to have some impact whether it's shorter contracts or you know whether the loan market bursts into life like again I, i'm kind of asking you to to look into your crystal ball a, a little bit but particularly in the premier league how how do you how much of an issue do you think this is or do you think it's just something we've got to ride out and it will probably be a bit messy for a while and then things will kind of go back to normal I kind of imagine that it's going to be speeding up kind of what has been happening where really kind of things are stratifying towards the top teams, um, really being able to, to dominate things. I think that's going to be, um, you know, the, what's going to happen even further. They're going to be the the teams that are in the, the best position um, either through owners that um, can add money or just because of their uh, revenue advantages that they already had. Um, I think they are just going to be in a better position. You already look at those teams. Those are the ones that are able to have longer contracts for players um, because they see them more as assets um, that, you know, they can, you know, trade, um, be able to do those kinds of things. Um, I think you're going to see more and more of that. Um, so I think it's mm. probably going to speed up more of that. Um, I think you'll probably see um, because things are going to go that way, you might see more of that, you know, Super League kind of thing because the the level playing field isn't going to be the same within countries. So you're going to have to look at how can we actually get teams that are on the, the level playing field. Um, I, I think this is going to just kind of push us into the future. What might have been, you know, 10 years down the road might be just a couple of years down the road. Mm. Um, it's it's going to be a huge change, I think, for how things are going to play out yeah and and i think really that that last sentence probably sums up uh, the whole conversation and the whole podcast um and and therefore uh, you know we've been talking about this for an hour and 10 minutes now and i don't think we've we've come up with any answers um but nevertheless kind of really good to get into the root of the discussion and and you know if if anything just emphasize how difficult all of this is um thanks so much for 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 listening um, thanks very much to our panel once again. Scott, thank you very much. Thank you. Clive, thank you. Cheers, Tim. Good job, mate. And Paul, thank you very much. No, no, thank you. Absolute pleasure. Um, and we'll be back again next week we'll do something fun for patrons and i'm sure we'll put another podcast out and maybe elliot will be back in the hosting chair maybe not but thanks very much for listening as always and we'll be with you and talk to you again after covid19 arsenal 20 